In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for granting us journey mercies to be here. And thank you for everyone, Lord, here, spirit, soul, and body. And we thank you, Lord, because you are ready to teach us, to reveal your mind, your word, your way unto us. We pray, Lord, we we'll receive as you reveal. And we pray that what you reveal, what we receive, will do good in every heart, every soul, every family, in Jesus' name. That those who are not saved will see the way of salvation very clearly. There will be conviction coming upon them. Those who are backsliding to you, that will show the way to come back into real restoration of real fellowship and relationship with you in Jesus' name. Those who are saved and need to be sanctified, purified, made holy, that Lord, the grace to have that experience, you grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We we'll pray for those who are waiting and looking up to you, that they will be enclosed with power, that the supernatural power, the Holy Spirit will come upon them. You'll do it in their lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, whatever it is, I want to reveal to anyone. And to everyone, reveal, lead us in the way that we will do what you are calling us to do. That the coming to the study will not be in vain. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We can be seated now. We're looking at the study today in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Already we have studied seven studies in this particular epistle. The epistle of Paul, the apostle, to the Thessalonians. And we have seen very clearly how God made use of Paul, of Silvanus, of Timothy. To come to Thessalonica and to preach the word. And to convince the people that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, a sin bearer. A substitute, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, who gave his life and he died for every sinner. And these people that had the word, they were convinced, they were convicted. And then they gave their lives to the Lord. They turned away from idolatry. They turned to the true God. And the very God of peace and pardon and power came in their lives and touched them and turned them around. And we find that lives totally changed. What they were before became totally different. They became followers of Christ, followers of the Lord, and followers of the apostle and the people that ministered unto them. We're told in chapter 1, chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 5, For a gospel came not unto you, in what only? but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. They watch the lives of the people that minister to them. They watch their motives, their method, the message, the manner of life, everything that they did. It captured them, captivated them. And then they said they wanted to have the same grace, the same righteousness, the same purity, the same lifestyle that these people had. And then they knew that they had to do something. Before there can be removal of sin, forgiveness of sin, there must be repentance because those two things, they go together. Repentance and remission of sin. That is turning away from sin and the Lord himself showing the mercy and the love and giving the forgiveness. We look at Luke chapter 24 and I'm reading there from verse 47. And you see the joining together of those two words there. Number one is repentance. Number two is remission. Number one is what man does. Turning away from sin. Turning away from evil. Checking up himself. Examining his life and saying, no, this ought not to be. This is wrong. This is sinful. This is iniquity. And I will do it no more. That repentance then attracts the love and the, faith and the peace of God. There's a remission, removal of the sin. In Luke chapter 24 verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at 
Jerusalem. That's the word that came to those Thessalonians. The word of repentance, the word of, of remission, of removal of sin, and of forgiveness. And then in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy and of the Holy Ghost. We're told that when we received the word of God, everything was not on a bed of roses. It wasn't so easy. Difficulties were there. They plowed through. Challenges were there. They went through. Persecution was there, and yet they stood. And the affliction that came, the contention that came, did not drive them back. They said, we have heard the truth, and we're going to stand and stay upon the truth. Look at verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of of entering in, we urge unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. They turned from their sin, they turned from their evil, and they turned away from all their iniquity and transgression, and they turned away from their idolatry, they turned away from their occultism, they turned away from their witchcraft. In fact, we're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, how the these people, how they turned, how they changed, how they abandoned idols and all the occultic works in their hand, how they abandoned everything. Because it was a kind of practical repentance. It was a kind of thorough repentance. It was a kind of complete repentance that everybody could see that these people, they are no more the people they used to be. And they were no more worshipping the kind of idols they were used to worship. They were no more in the occultism they were before. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19 and verse 18. And many that believed came and they confessed and showed their deeds. These people that repented, they showed their deeds. It wasn't a kind of private repentance and secret repentance that nobody will know about this. They wanted everybody to know. We're on the wrong way before. We're living a wrong life before. We're doing something wrong before. But now we have turned. And now we have changed. And there's a change, a transformation that came upon our lives. Many of them that believed, they came and they confessed and they showed their deeds. In verse 19, many of them also would choose curious arts, magical things, witchcraft, sorcery, as well as idolatrous things, occultic things, curious arts brought their books together. And they burnt them before all men, public, open, external, not something private, secret, as if they were sneaking away to serve the Lord. They said, when we served the devil in the past, we made it public and external. And now we're going to serve the Lord, we're going to make it public and external. Everybody is going to see that we mean this and we're going to do this to give glory to the Lord. And they burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Come back to First Thessalonians chapter 1. And then they began to tell other people too that what we have done you could do. What we have received, you could receive. The grace that came into our lives can come into your life too. And the joy of salvation that we experience, you can experience that too. And then the hope of glory, the hope of heaven that we now have, you can have that too. Look at verse 8 of chapter 1. It says, for from you sounded out the words of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God. God, to God's word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And now ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now they were having hope in the Lord that Christ will be coming again because they had heard the whole truth from the birth of Christ to the life of Christ, to the miracles of Christ, to the signs and wonders of Christ, to the healing virtue of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had heard everything about the Lord Jesus Christ, his sinless life, his spotless life, and his righteous life, his sanctified life, his heavenly life. They had heard about everything concerning Jesus Christ, his betrayal 
fail. And also the way he did not open his mouth and he suffered as a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And you have heard about his death, his vicarious death that he died for us, and about his burial, and about his rising again. And they had heard about his going to heaven, seated on the right hand of majesty on high. And they have heard about his coming again, that Jesus Christ, the same Jesus that was taken away from you, is coming again as you have seen him go up into heaven. And now they knew that when he comes, he'll come to take us home. And they were waiting for that, chapter 1, verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, they, as you go to chapter 2, he reminded them again. It's like, it's like overlapping what had been said in chapter 1, because in the latter part of verse 5, which I read to you already, Paul, the apostle, briefly alluded to the righteousness and the pure life and the holy character of those ministers, that he is himself, and the other ministers that ministered unto them while they were in Thessalonica. And he said, as you know, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Now in this second chapter is giving them a more thorough review of their ministry and then of their motives and then of the message and then of the methods and the manner of life that they live. He wanted them to know and to recollect and to remember that the kind of life they live, they lived unto God, not unto men and that they were not about to honor men and please men, exalt men and glorify men. They were just about to please the Lord. He was telling them that what we have done you should do, forget about men. And don't think that all your life you'll be honoring men, you'll be kind of exalting men, you'll be pleasing men, you'll be exalting the Lord alone. You'll be honoring the Lord alone. You'll be pleasing the Lord alone. That's why he said for yourselves brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. But even after in verse 2 chapter 2 after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated. They were kind of insulted and abused and oppressed and whipped and beaten even in prison in Philippi and were shamefully entreated as she not Philippi who were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention for exhortation was not of deceit. It was not talking about their manner of life, their message, their attitude, the lifestyle, their character. That we demonstrated the conversion. We preached conversion, we demonstrated it. We preached humility, we demonstrated it. And we preach the righteous life that the Christian ought to live, and we demonstrated it because our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness. No, in Gal, but as we are loud of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men. The problem of those Thessalonians before they came to know the Lord was that they were just pleasing men every time. They didn't have a mind of their own, a life of their own, a will of their own, and a perception of their own. The society controls them, just like for the sinners today. Sinners today, they don't have any mind of their own, any will of their own, any decision of their own. They cannot do anything independently on their own. They just please society. And then Paul, the apostle, said, when we were with you, we demonstrated it to you that we are not about to please any man, not as pleasing men, but God. God, which tries our hearts for neither at any time, any time since that time, since we came to you, and since we returned to all the places of ministry, neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Then he said in verse 6 of chapter 2, of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been but in some as the apostles of Christ. Now we come to what we are looking at today. We have to do that review so that you'll be able to connect with what we did before and what we're doing today. I'm looking at verse 7 now, chapter 2, reading all through to verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. But we were gentle among you. It's talking about their lives, about their attitude, about their conduct about their demeanor, 
about their comportment. It says we're gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherishes our children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because she were dear unto us. It said, when we preach, we preach with our heart, our mind, our soul, our body, our talent, our gift, everything within us. They were not just empty words, isolated words, dry words that had no power, no passion, no pungency within each. We're willing to give everything we've got with the gospel. You know, there are people that, you know, they preach the gospel and they preach the word of God in such a way that they want to preserve their personality and preserve their integrity and preserve their a kind of authority and power position and uh, preserve whatever it is but paul the apostle said no we give the gospel and we're willing to give a very soul as well then he said for you remember don't you remember brethren in verse 9 our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we will not be chargeable unto any of you we preach unto you the gospel of god i pray that god will give us such preachers today in jesus name not only that he'll give us that you yourself you are hearing that the lord will touch your life and transform you that you'll be such a soul winner such a worker and such a preacher today in jesus name you see paul the apostle recognized something that um, uh, ministry is not just what we say ministry is not just what we do ministry is how we live our character is more important than anything we say than anything we do in ministry in spiritual service whether you are preaching you are counseling you are praying you are encouraging other people you are exhorting other people you are following up other people whatever it is you are doing touching their lives and turning them around and turning them to the lord whatever it is you are doing in ministry in spiritual service the character of the worker the character of the soul winner and the character of the preacher decides the quality of his ministry his service and his work our unconscious influence speaks more loudly and more effectively than our conscious influence a christian's character a minister's character is the whole capital it has for carrying on an eternal eternally profitable business a minister or a christian who has lost his character has lost everything a worker a soul winner a child of god a believer a member of the church a leader of people who has lost his character has lost everything think about something he lost his character. He's lost everything. Couldn't be judged over the people of Israel anymore. Think about Solomon. Lost his character. Lost everything. He was still there as a figurehead. But the power, the authority was gone. And people knew that man became just a piece of bread. Lifeless. Because of all the many women he surrounded himself with. And think about Saul. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, you have lost your character. The Lord has also rejected you. Think about Judas Iscariot, one of the apostles. He lost his character. He lost the ministry. And the apostles, when they came together in chapter 1 of Acts of the Apostles, they said, another person will take his place. Because Judas Iscariot, he fell away from the ministry and the bishopric. And think about Demas. Demas has loved the present world and has gone on to Thessalonica. But when he got to Thessalonica, he didn't preach there. Could he preach there? Look at Second Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading verse 10. Second Timothy chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 10. For Demas has forsaken me. He forsook the way of righteousness, the way of holiness. He forsook the way of the Lord. He forsook the watch of the Lord. And he forsook the ministry. He forsook the minister also that the Lord had given him to lead him and to help him and to guide him unto real successful ministry. But Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, having loved this present world, and is departed unto where? Tell me out loud. Do you have any influence there? 
Oh, the people knew he was a backslider. Whatever he said, who wants to listen to a backslider? He had gone away from the Lord. The point is, a Christian worker, a Christian minister, a Christian preacher, or a pastor, a shepherd, an overseer, whatever it is, once you've lost your character, you've lost everything. That's why Paul, the apostle, appealed to their memory. He said, recollect when we came. Remember, when we came, you know. And he said, you know, you know, you know. Nine times in false Thessalonians alone, referring to those Thessalonians first hand observation of their private life as well as their public life. The lifestyle of the ministers reveals spiritual value and qualities worthy of emulation that they could follow them. In fact, the Bible says in chapter 1 verse 6, they followed them. They became followers of us and of the Lord. The ministers were courageous. They preached the saving face and the sanctifying gospel message fearlessly despite great opposition. There was no clever plot to deceive anyone within or outside the church. Their responsibility was to please the Lord by the faithful proclamation of the divinely revealed message no matter what man's reaction might be. They were faithful. We are going to be faithful. I said we are going to be faithful. Nobody was watching over Paul the Apostle. You know that. The people in Jerusalem, that is, uh, the apostles in Jerusalem, they were not watching over him. They were not re any report of him. You know, some people, if you are not watching over them, looking over their shoulder, looking at what they are doing, investigating, examining what they are doing, they cannot be faithful. In the case of Paul the apostle, nobody watched over him. Nobody investigated. Nobody examined. But he just knew. We have been put in trust by the Lord. And we are going to be faithful to the Lord. And that man was faithful to the Lord. The Holy Ghost watched over him. He knew that Jesus Christ was watching over him. And he knew that God the Father, who had entrusted him with the gospel, he was watching everything he did and every way he went. And because of that, he was faithful. We are going to be faithful. We're going to divide the study to three parts. Number one. Number one, we have the ministerial affection for a model church. Ministerial affection. You see here the shepherd, the pastor, Paul the apostle, manifesting that affection, that love. Ministerial affection for a model church. Number two, membership allegiance. Membership allegiance in a maturing congregation. Those people, they didn't take Paul apostle for granted. They didn't take his sacrifice for granted, his service for granted, and his dedication. They didn't take that for granted. They didn't take his loyalty, his faithfulness for granted. They said, this Paul, see him committed, sacrificial, serving us, preaching to us, declaring unto us the whole counsel of God. And because of that, they responded well. They reciprocated. And they had affection for the apostle too. They had this kind of allegiance unto him. That means then that as the minister is doing his best to be faithful, to be loyal, and to be a kind of, a, to sacrifice everything is God. Ministry to the congregation. The congregation too must reciprocate, must respond, must not take the sacrifice and the service of our ministers, our leaders for granted. And that's what they did. We have, me, me, we have membership allegiance in a maturing congregation. Number three, the main activity of the master's commitment. Paul the apostle returned that to that again. He said, you must remember, you must recall, you must know what we did when we were with you. And we just sold ourselves out completely unto the ministry. And we're praying that such dedication the Lord will give to every one of us today in Jesus' name. Let's come to number one, ministerial affection for a model church. Ministerial affection. Look at chapter 2 of 4 Thessalonians, chapter 2 verse 7. But we were gentle among you. We were gentle among you. Isn't that a great, a great revelation for Paul the apostle to say we were gentle among you. Don't you know the background of Paul the apostle? He was Saul. He was Saul of Tarsus. It was a man that got authority. It was a man that will go with letters from the Sanhedrin. It will go into the houses. It was a violent man. He himself said an injurious man. He himself said a blasphemous man. A blasphemer. He himself said he will go into their houses and get them out of their houses. And then he will get the men and the women into prison. 
courageous man. But then his courage was negative. His courage, he didn't care when those women were weeping and crying, when the children were weeping for their parents being taken to the prison. He was a hardened man, hard-hearted man, a wicked man. He was a murderous, a murderous man. And yet now conversion came. And now a change had come. And he said, what I was, I can't do that again. Violent and wicked and hard-hearted and cruel and kind of bossy and overpowering, overbearing. I can't do that again. What gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherishes her children. He's talking about a nursing mother. The way a nursing mother will take care of the children, that's all we did among you. And you can tell that a real conversion had taken place. And those of us who are ministering today, maybe sometimes your background might have been like a street man, a street boy. Your background might be somebody who was very aggressive, always fighting, always quarreling. Your background might be that you are very bossy. And then you shout and quarrel. And you were used to that in the past. Once you become converted, gentleness will take over your life. The violence that was there before will go away. And the kind of uh, wicked atrocities that you did before, everything will go away. You'll be able to say, like Paul the Apostle, we were gentle among you as a nurse, cherishes our children. Paul and his companions in ministry were gentle. That means they were tender. That means they were loving. Among the Thessalonians, as a nursing mother caring for her own children, the new converts had need of being fed with the wholesome bread of life. And they gently took care of them and fed them. They also had need of being counseled and being directed in the way of righteousness. And they did that like a mother will tenderly take care of the children. And then they had need of being taught to walk on the highway of holiness. And like a little child, a little toddler rising up and falling and then trying to walk and grab something. And the mother will not brought beat or push that child down or discourage the child. And when the child is crying, the mother will pick that child up. Paul the Apostle said, that's how we did it. When you were learning to walk, walk in the way of righteousness, walk in the way of the truth, and then you made mistakes, were gentle among you, as a nurse will cherish her children. And then they were preserved from stumbling and led in the right path and the good way. Paul and the ministers carried on this ministry with a pure intention and sacrificial love of a devoted mother. And that's what the Lord is telling us today, that we need to do the same thing. And you ought to be able to tell your people, you ought to be able to tell the people you are shepherding. And the people you are winning, you are winning their souls. And the people that you are counseling, and the people you are taking care in the house fellowship, and the people you are taking care of in the fellowship that he is in the church, you ought to be able to say, don't you remember, we are gentle among you. Gentle among you, as a nurse cherishes her children. What was he telling them? He was telling them that the whole church shall have the meekness of Christ. We've demonstrated it to you. They shall have the gentleness of Christ. We've demonstrated it unto you. Look at Matthew chapter 11. The life of Christ. The pattern of Christ. The meekness of Christ. The gentleness of Christ. He said, we got it. We demonstrated it to you. And we reacted, we related with you. With that. And you too, you relate with us like that. You relate with one another like that. That is the evidence that grace has touched your life. That is the evidence that grace has come and taken over your life. Matthew chapter 11, reading from verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. When you come to the Lord, you take his yoke upon you. The yoke of the devil, you cast that away. The yoke of society, you cast that away. And the yoke of tradition, you cast that away. And the yoke of your past life, you cast that away. And the yoke of your habits, habits of the past, you cast that away. Here is the evidence of knowing the Lord. That you take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You begin to observe the Lord. You begin to see how he dealt with the disciples, how he dealt with the children, how he dealt with the women, how he dealt with the sick, how he dealt with the weak, how he dealt with the needy, how he dealt with the poor. And he says, you learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For 
my yoke is tough and difficult. What? Easy. If your own yoke you put upon people, tough, hard, and when you are there, it's like everybody wants to hide and go into their holes, then you are not like Christ. Christ said, my yoke is easy and my body is light. You never want to put any burden on anybody that is hard to bear. That's the Pharisee. That's the Sadducee. That's the religious people. The people that do not have any conversion, any change of life, that's how they did it. But in the case of those who know the Lord, you want to follow after the Lord and you want to follow Paul, the apostle. He said, we are gentle among you as a nurse, cherishes her children. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 9 all through to verse 11. Isaiah chapter 40. Reading from verse 9, O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains, O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold the Lord God. God will come with strong hand and with and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Listen to this. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall how? Gently lead, gently lead, gently lead, gently lead those that are with young. Do you lead that way? You want somebody to do something? Do you do it by force? Like a military person? Or do you act like a shepherd? Like a nursing mother? How do you treat children? How do you treat women? How do you treat the sisters? How do you treat even your leaders? your coordinators and your group coordinators, when you want them to do something, do you use a sword, a spear, a hammer, a kind of voice that terrifies? Even when you speak to your seniors, to your daddy, to your mommy, how do you do it? When there's conversion, it tells us you'll gently, gently lead those that I was young. And Paul the Apostle said, that's how we did it. And we did that so that the whole church will catch that same virtue, that same grace, that same life, that same manner of life, that gentleness will kind of saturate the whole church. We're looking at Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 8. Philippians chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 8 all through to verse 11. It says in verse 8, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you in all the bowels of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm yearning over you. It wasn't, you know, a hard-hearted man that you'll say, I don't care. I know God. I don't want to know people. I love God. I don't, I don't care what the people feel, how the people feel. You know, I'm so independent and so isolated. I can live without everybody else. I'm independent. Not Paul the Apostle. He said, I'm like a mother. I yearn over my children. I desire my children. I love my children. I have affection for my children. I'm gentle towards my children. And he was talking about the members of the church. And then he said, and this I pray in verse 9, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He said, the number one thing I want to see in your life is the tenderness and the affection and, and the affection, the charity and the love. I don't want to see your gift first. I don't want to see your stature first. I don't want to see your knowledge first. I don't want to see your ability first. I don't want to see your boisterous nature first. I want to see your love first. I want to see your affection first. I want to see your tenderness first. I want to see your motherly attitude first. That's why he said, and then he said that she may approve in verse 10, the things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus unto the glory and the praise of 
God. I will come into a second, uh, that's second chapter now in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. He's telling us that it was not really himself. He, pre- he, he puts another man on the stage and he says, look at this man too and see the way he served. Because now you know he has said, I gave you the gospel. And with the gospel, I was willing to give my very life, my very soul. Because we were tender among you. We are going to impart unto you the gospel and our souls. And then it's because you are precious, you are dear unto us. And he said, you know, it's not just me. It's not just me. Anybody that knows the love of Christ, anybody that is constrained by the love of Christ, he will do the same thing as well. Chapter 2 of Philippians verse 25. He says, yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier and your but your minister your messenger and he that ministered to my wants for he longed after you all he desired you he was passionate for you he couldn't sleep when he didn't see you he was just thinking about you he loved you so much have you heard about that? It's like when a man loves a woman and they just maybe they're in courtship and he says, I can't eat without thinking about you and I can't sleep without thinking about you. I'm thinking about you all the time. I'm longing after you. I want to see you. That's the kind of love Epaphroditus had for the Philippians. And Paul, the apostle said, he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that he heard that he had been sick. Why was he sick? Look at verse 27. For indeed, he was sick nice unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. He said, I couldn't lose a man like that, a minister like that, a leader like that, a fellow helper like that, a person to have that kind of love, affection for the people of God, and he didn't even care for his life. He was willing to throw away his life because we're caring for the people of God. I couldn't lose a man like that. I sent him, therefore, in verse 28, therefore, the more carefully that when you see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful receive him, therefore, in verse 29, in the Lord, with all gladness and whole such in reputation. He said, reciprocate when you see people that sacrifice reciprocate hold them in reputation and not just act to them ordinarily know that they are sacrificing everything they've got to minister the gospel to you they're tender they're loving they're gentle they're affectionate they're compassionate and because of that show love to them too and they're giving so much give them something back verse 30 because for the work of christ it was nice unto death not regarding his own life to supply your lack of service toward me he said that man was willing to throw away his soul just like i do he wanted to just give the gospel not the gospel only but also his own soul and the lord is saying that if other people have done that, we can do that too. And we're going to do it in Jesus' name. I said we'll do it in Jesus' name. And when, when you're minister, you're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about hurting anybody. You're not thinking about offending anybody, annoying anybody. You're thinking, I just want to show love. I just want to show tenderness. I just want to show compassion. I just want to reciprocate. I just want to be a blessing to the congregation, to the leadership, and to those who are followers, to the ministers, and to the members. That's the right attitude to have. But when you're ministering and then you want to throw stone, you want to throw a sword, you want to throw a spear on somebody, you want to cut down somebody, you want to criticize somebody, you want to destroy somebody. That's why the house fellowship is no more thriving as it used to. Because, you know, the affection is no more like it used to be. The love is not as it used to be. The gentleness and the tenderness is no more as it used to be. It will come back. I said you'll come back. If it's going to come back, you forget yourself. And you look at the needs of the people, the poor, the sick, the weak, the backsliding, the new converts, those people that cannot bear all your terror and all your lousy and loud kind of shouting on them, then you lower your voice. Then you become tender. And then you say, we must be gentle among the people of God. In the house fellowship, just like a nursing mother, 
will, not, will cherish and nourish her children. I pray God will help us. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4 verse 1. Philippians chapter 4 verse 1. We'll see that these, uh, the same thing Paul the Apostle was saying. It says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. Dearly beloved and longed for. You know, some people think that if you're a teacher, you know the word of God, you must be just a teacher, that love is not there, affection is not there, remembering people is not there, greeting people is not there, smiling to people is not there, desiring to see people is not there, just teach, just teach and just teach. No, Paul the Apostle was the greatest teacher that ever lived. If you compare with anybody in the Old Testament or New Testament, with any apostle, anywhere, he was the greatest of all teachers. And yes, he said, my brethren dearly beloved and longed for my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He said that in verse 1. He said, my dearly beloved, before he said that again. He must really be in love with all those people like a shepherd wanting to take care of the sheep, like a mother wanting to take care of his children. That's how Paul ministered. That's how we're going to now begin to minister. Everywhere, anywhere, so that our love will show and the people will feel that love. And they'll say, I cannot uh, get the message, I cannot throw the message away because of the love. There's so much love from that preacher as a mother cares and nurtures her children without seeking the praise of men or recognition from anybody. So, Paul, the apostle, fed and nursed and cherished and taught and led and discipled the believers without seeking material gain. Uh, can you think? of any mother trying to maybe breastfeed the child and then trying to get some awards, some recognition, some praise, some honor for that. No. Just does that out of love. Can you think of a, a mother changing the nappies for the child and then trying to get some recognition, some praise and some clapping because of no. She just does that. She says, I'm a mother. It's within me, and I have to do that. I'm not waiting for anybody to say thank you, to praise me, and to appreciate me. You know, there are people that cannot minister except you are clapping for them, except you are praising them, except you are exalting them, except you are commending them every time, except you are recommending them to everybody else. Or they say, they don't appreciate what I do. A mother doesn't say that. A mother just does what she needs to do. And Paul, the apostle, was saying, we minister like mothers. The tenderness of the mother, the affection of the mother. We just did everything that we ought to do. Like a mother nursing her children with all sincerity and selfless labor of love. Paul did all things in transparent and transcending love. He, he never stooped to any degrading method of flattery. Or in sincerity, in order to achieve results, his words were honest and truthful, and his motives were free from hypocrisy. The preachers may sometimes be tempted to hold back the full truth for fear of repercussion from those who contribute to their support. Can you think of a mother trying to hold back the truth from a child because he wants the, she wants the child to smile at her and therefore she will not tell the child that that's a bottle of poison. Don't drink that. But the mother, whatever the child will feel, the, mother, the child may not even understand, but if it's a bottle of poison, the mother will say, hey, my child, don't touch that, don't drink that because it's poison. It will kill you. And I love you so much, I'd rather die in your place than see you die. And because of that, the mother will do everything that is to be done. Not waiting for the praise of anybody. And not being afraid of the frown or the fury of anyone. And that's how we are also to live our lives. Not uh, trying to hold the truth back because of fear of repercussion from those who contribute to our support. Because God is the judge. And he knows when the message is watered down and suppressed to nurse the weakness or wickedness of the minister. Rather than to minister to the welfare of the children of God. I pray God will keep us faithful. We come to point number two now. How did these members, how did they respond to this? How did they react to this? What was their life? And what was the way they repaid or uh, what was the way they kind of uh, uh, gave back what they have received? Uh, you know something that is wrong about what you call the Dead Sea? The Dead Sea is always receiving but not giving out. And it stinks. It's deadly. 
And there are people that just receive. And many people show love to you. You know, we we'll, we'll preach. That's because of love. Want to, to get you out of hell, out of darkness, out of judgment, out of eternal punishment. We're giving to you. We're sacrificing everything with God so that the love of God will be very clear and very plain to you. And then you'll be born again. And if you're born again already, you'll be sanctified. If you're sanctified, you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll have the gifts of the Spirit. And if you have the gifts already, we'll place you in ministry. You'll be useful to the kingdom of God. We're doing everything we can do to make sure that you have everything the Lord died to give you, provide for you on the cross of Calvary. Are you give anything back? Are you repaying? Are you kind of responding well and saying, I've got love. I show that love again. I got some grace. I'm going to show that grace. I've got some help. I'm going to show, give that help. I've got some counseling and some lifting up. I'm going to lift up the people who are lifting me up. Reciprocate, respond, show it again. And so that is why we're coming now to, we're coming to First Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you the gospel of God, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because she was dear unto us. These Thessalonians, how did they respond? Let me show you chapter 1 verse 6. Chapter 1 verse 6, you became followers of us. Followers of us. How does a daughter show that she really appreciates the mother? She begins to walk like the mother, talk like the mother, look like the mother, stand like the mother. How does a son show that he really appreciates daddy? He begins to be in daddy's shoes, even though the shoes are big, puts his feet in the daddy's shoes and likes to dress like daddy and talk like daddy and stand like daddy and walk like daddy, copying daddy with good intention. And how did the Thessalonians show that they actually appreciated Paul the Apostle? They became followers of us. The, the lifestyle that Paul the Apostle had lived, they want to live that too. And of the Lord, the Lord he spoke about, the Lord he preached about, we love that Lord. We accept that Lord. We receive that Lord. I want to be like that Lord. Having received the word in much affliction, they loved those apostles more than their very lives. They didn't say the persecution is too much, affliction is too much. They said he suffered for us. We're going to suffer for him too. He came and he gave us the gospel. He did that with more contention and affliction. And we can bear some of the fire, some of the flame, and some of the, some of the furnace too. Because they suffered for us in preaching to us. We're also going to suffer for them and make them happy. That's how they reciprocated. And that's how we ought to reciprocate. We ought to be thoughtful that these people who are preaching the gospel to us, they're giving up much. And we also need to give up much on their behalf. Look at chapter 2 verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13, it says, for, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye had of us, of us, of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Those Thessalonians, you know, their reaction, they said, that's God speaking. That's not just Paul. Is filled with the Spirit of God. Whenever he was passionate, they said, that's the fire of the Holy Ghost. Whenever he was very fast and quick, they said, that's the excitement and the zeal of the Lord Jesus. They put a, the best construction, a positive construction on everything that Paul the Apostle did. And they said, the word is preaching. It's not the word of men. It's the word of God. That's the way they reciprocated. That's the way they responded. That's the way they showed that the way he loved them, the same way they loved him. Too. Look at chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good news, good tidings of your faith and your charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us, always desiring greatly to see us as we were, as we also to see you. 
look at that. Paul the apostle said, I've been thinking about you. In a local language, you say, I've been dreaming about you. And they said, Timothy, go tell Paul with you. I've been dreaming about you and thinking about you. When are you coming? We greatly desire to see your face as you like to see us. Isn't that the way fellowship should be? And love should not be a one-way thing that we just love. We never get love back. We just show affection. We never get affection back. And we show tenderness. We never get t- tenderness back. And we show gentleness. We never get gentleness back. And we show loyalty. We never get loyalty back. We show faithfulness. We never get faithfulness back. No. But you see these people, they said, Timothy, go and tell Paul the apostle. Yes, we thank God, Timothy, you have come. We receive so much comfort and so much encouragement and so much exhortation from you. But go and tell Paul that we want to see him and we greatly desire to see him just like he wants to see us. Look at verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distressed by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And for what signs can we render to God again for you? For all the joy where we were joy for your sake because before our God. Can you see this? How Paul the Apostle, he, he got it back from them. Reciprocation. That the same love he had shown them and the same affection he has shown them. The people, they said, we love you too. We want to show affection to you too. We also want to see your face. And Paul the Apostle said, you know, what comfort we got? He said, you do know what peace we got and what kind of satisfaction we got because we see that as we are reaching out to you and longing after you too, you are reaching out to us and you are longing after us. And I'm saying that that's the way it ought to be and I pray it will be like that in Jesus' name. And you know, the mother feels so happy when she has loved a child and cared for a child. And then child, that, that child goes to school and always rushing back home saying, I want to see mommy. I want to see mommy. And then when she comes up, puts the bag down and says, Mommy, where are you? Mommy, where are you? That mother will have real, real joy because she knows she has not labored in vain over that child. Or maybe it's daddy that has traveled. And then daddy came back. As daddy came back, the boys have been paying football. And then they said, Daddy is back. Daddy is back. And then they came back to the house saying, Daddy, welcome. Daddy, welcome. How are you? You've been so, you've been away for so long. That daddy will be very, very happy because there's reciprocal question because that daddy now knows that the children love him just as much as he loved them he's gone away trading and walking and trying to get money to take care of those children and when he came back those children too they say daddy welcome they're not even asking what did you buy for me what did you bring for me they just daddy welcome just happy to see the face of daddy and that's the kind of thing that Paul the apostle said we got joy we've got comfort we've got contentment we're so happy because you were thinking about us just like we too were thinking about you look at Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4 Romans chapter 16 I'm reading there from verses 3 and 4 Romans chapter 16 verses 3 and 4 Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who are for my life laid down their own necks. You see that? For my life, they laid down their very necks. That's what I'm talking about, the reciprocation, the showing of the affection that the leaders who have ministered to us, the ministers who have ministered to us, the pastors who have ministered unto us, that to show that love back to you, they planted the sword, that you plant and you sow love, affection, and the goodness into their lives to you. That Paul the Apostle said, you know what gives me joy, church in Rome, what gives me joy is this, that you have are ready to lay down your life for me, especially Priscilla and Aquila. And it says, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. I pray we'll see that kind of love again. I said we'll see that kind of love again. We're looking at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 15. Galatians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 15. And let's see, this is the way the early church, this is the way they should love, and this is the way the love of 
God just saturated their hearts and they manifested it to one another and then to their leaders, to their preachers and to the leadership of the church that ministered unto them. Galatians chapter 4 verse 15, it says where then is the, is the blessedness you speak of for I bear your record that if it, if it had been possible, you would have plugged out your own eyes and have given them unto me. See love. See affection. And see, a, see the people wanting to reciprocate and giving back again what you had given unto them. I, Paul, the apostle said, I bear you record. I can tell when I first came to you, when I first preached the gospel to you, how you showed that affection back, the allegiance you showed back unto me as your pastor, as your leader, as your minister, as your evangelist, as a shepherd, as the one that led you into the truth. You are willing to even pluck out your eyes and give that unto to me and i pray that that same thing we'll see in our lives in the church today in jesus name you know if we do that our pastors will not be getting discouraged if we do that our ministers will not be getting discouraged if we do that and we take care that we're reciprocating and we're showing the affection and the love we're showing it back then our overseers will not be getting discouraged and life will come back again courage will come back again loyalty faithfulness will come back again and we'll do the work of god tirelessly in jesus name we're going to do it i said we're going to do it I told you before that uh, you know something that is even uh, commendable for the Thessalonians is that Demas went to Thessalonica, but he couldn't he couldn't confuse the people, he couldn't sway the people, he couldn't go to talk to them. Well, that Paul, what do you think about him? He couldn't blackmail, insult, he couldn't try to turn the minds of the people away from Paul the apostle. I read it to you. How Demas forsook the, forsook the apostle. He went to Thessalonica. But those people will not even look at anybody opposed to Paul the apostle. That's why Paul the apostle said, now we leave. We leave. If you stand in the faith because you are standing. And there's nobody able to confuse you. Because of that, we are so happy in the ministry. We want to do more than what we have done. And we are rejoicing. I pray that we are your leaders. We we'll rejoice over you to enjoy. Jesus name. The Thessalonians also felt the same affection and attachment to Paul the apostle and the ministers. Paul and the ministers were also dear to the Thessalonians because I've read it to you already. When Timotheus came from you unto us and he brought us good tidings that ye have good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Their love for Paul the apostle was not superficial and it wasn't sentimental at all. It was a pure love, a holy kind of love. It was demonstrated in holy living and consecrated service. And the same thing the Lord is going to do in you. I said they will do in you. Yeah. We're now going to point number three. Point number three, main activity with the master's commitment. The main activity with the master's commitment. In uh, First Thessalonians, I'm looking at chapter 2, verse 9. Here, Paul the Apostle now, he wants to tell us a little about his secular involvement in the midst of spiritual uh, kind of assignment that he has got. Here is spiritual assignment, the great work he was to do, the preaching of the gospel, and the winning of souls into the kingdom, and the developing and the maturing of those souls in the kingdom. And yet, he still had some secular work on the side. And that secular work did not eat into the spiritual work, and yet he committed himself and did the work he ought to do with all the subtle soul, with real loyalty, faithfulness, commitment, and fruitfulness too. In First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Uh, can you see what Paul the Apostle here was saying? He said, you remember? 
you recollect how we walked among you. He said, we labored night and day. Night and day. By the way, as you look at what Paul the Apostle has said over there, you will, you will see that kind of language was very common with Paul the Apostle because that is how he labored every time. Night and day, day and night. Night and day, day and night. And he's telling us about the commitment that you and I ought to have. It's telling us about the power, the authority that you ought to manifest. It's telling us about the goodness of the Lord, the things that you ought to do. Uh, come to chapter 20 of Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. I'm looking at chapter 20 and I'm looking at verse 31. Acts chapter 20, verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone how night and day with tears this is passion this is compassion this is faithfulness this is zeal this is commitment he said i did it night and day i want you to look at second thessalonians second thessalonians chapter three in second thessalonians chapter three is going to remind us again how he walked it's going to remind us again how he labored. We were looking at Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse eight. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, and uh, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, night and day, night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto any of you. When you find people that are really committed, they are not trying to manage their strength. They're not going to, they're not trying to keep their strength and save their energy. They're not trying to say, I can't give all, I can't do all, I can't give all my strength, all my life, and just labor like that. I have to reserve some of the energy for myself. I need to take care of myself. I need to take care of what I have. I cannot spend everything I've got upon the people. Night and day, night and day. By the way, do you know that this is how even other people, look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 6. This is how they labored as well. This is how they prayed. This is how they travailed for the people of God because of the love, because of the affection, night and day, night and day, night and day. In Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 6. Verse 6, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. Night and day, day and night. That's what Nehemiah did. That's why he forsook all the great lucrative job that he had, and then he went to rebuild the broken walls of Jerusalem. He was passionate. He was compassionate. And everything was light, night and day. I want you to look at uh, Lamentation chapter 2. Lamentation chapter 2. And then you see it again, night and day, night and day, night and day. We're looking at Lamentation chapter 2 verse 18. Their hearts cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like like a river day and night like that like uh, give thyself no rest let not the apple of thine eyes cease uh, they were concerned for the children the children of israel that were roaming about on the street and they do not have spiritual meat and spiritual bread i said let the tears pour down and pour your out before the lord again night and day night and day look at isaiah chapter 62 just night and day isaiah chapter 62 this is how the people of old, this is how they did it. And this is how the people that were giving to the Lord, this is how they did it. And this is what the Lord is telling us to do to you, that you'll give yourself, abandon yourself to the work of the Lord. Have passion, have compassion, have zeal, have fire, have fervency, and give everything you've got night and day, day and night. Isaiah chapter 62, I'm reading from verse 6. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 6 I have set watchmen upon thy walls of Jerusalem which shall never hold their peace day nor night ye that make mention of the Lord keep not silence he's saying I've given you watchmen those watchmen as the shepherd those watchmen as the pastor those watchmen those are the leaders those were the people watching over the people give yourself no rest day nor night and give him no rest till he establish until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. 
And it's not only for men. I've read about Nehemiah, that's a man. I've read about Isa, that's a man. And I've read in Lamentation, men and women, daughters of Zion. Now look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. If you, you're a woman and you also, you give yourself to the Lord. And you know that we are waiting for redemption in the house of God. We are waiting for real righteousness, sanctification, holiness and purity. The very life of God and of Christ coming in the hearts of the children of God. And you need to give yourself unto supplication, intercession, prayer, desire, longing for days to come, night and day. We are looking at Luke chapter 2 verse 37. Luke chapter 2 verse 37. And she was a widow of about four school and for years which departed not from the temple but served God with fasting and prayers night and day night and day you see that's what the Lord is expecting from you you see that was the widow just before Jesus went to the cross look at first Timothy chapter 5 verse 5 first Timothy chapter 5 and we're reading there from verse 5 first Timothy chapter 5 verse 5 now she, that's a widow indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. You see, what Paul the Apostle did, he wasn't alone. The other people too, they did the same. From Nehemiah to Isaiah, and then to all the people, Jeremiah in the Lamentation, and then to the widow in the New Testament. And the Lord wants that to, be, to, to still continue now, even before the coming of the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. The Lord is saying that we ought to pray like that, passionate like that, compassionate like that, and fervent and zealous like that, as the Lord is preparing to come. And we want to prepare the church, the people of God, for the coming of the Lord. We're passionate to you, we're zealous to you, we're loyal to you, we're faithful to you, and we're giving everything, we've got laying everything upon the altar, and praying to the Lord, desiring night and day that the Lord will do great things among the people of God, getting people saved and getting them sanctified, and feeling sanctified people of the Holy Ghost. We're praying for that and seeking Him night and day. Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 7. Luke chapter 18 verse 7 Shall not God avenge his own elect Which cried day and night unto him Though he bear long with them I tell you in verse 8 That he will avenge them speedily Nevertheless when the son of man cometh Shall he find faith on the earth Even when it is near the coming of the Lord He wants us to have that passion That compassion Night and day Night and day Day. And Paul the apostle, he had that main activity, but he gave himself to it. He committed himself unto it. And therefore, he will not relent. He will not slow down. He will not back up. He will not be tired. He will not delay his service. I'll not, he will not give it with half-heartedness. He will not give it with laxity. He will not give it with lukewarmness. He poured out his very soul into everything that he did. And he was a model for us. And we're going to follow suit. We're going to do the same. I said we're going to do the same. We're going to be able to say, oh Lord, this is my life. This is the center of my life. The focus of my life. The priority of my life. I've come to do your will, oh God. In Psalm 40 verse 7. Psalm 40. I'm reading from verse 7 all through to verse 9. Psalm 40. We're reading it from verse 7 all through to verse, uh, to verse 9. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is reaching up me. I delight to do thy will. I'm not just enduring the will of God, tolerating the will of God. I'm not, I'm not just, uh, you know, sluggish in doing the will of God. I delight. I enjoy. This is my joy. I celebrate the will of God. And I want to do that will and commit myself totally, entirely, completely unto it. I delight to do thy will, oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. 
Lo, I have not refrained my lips, so Lord, thou knowest. And let's look at Mark chapter 1 and see how the Lord Jesus Christ committed himself unto this ministry. And how he gave himself without any reservation. And even when it appeared it could be popular, he will not trade the service with popularity. You know, there are some people, all they want is, you know, they are popular and everybody's seeking after them. And where the need is, they're not willing to go because they say, if I leave this place, I'm not going to be as popular anymore. Look at chapter 1 of Mark. Mark chapter 1, we're reading from verse 36. Mark chapter 1, verse 36, and Simon, and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. I'm asking you a question now. If you are told in your own district, all men are seeking for you. If you are told in your own group, all men are seeking for you. And now there is need in another place, another district, another group, another city another country and we say brother come on here we're transferring you to this other place and this other city or this other country and meanwhile all men here all people here are looking for you you are popular you are exalted you are honored how would you feel when they told Jesus Christ, all men seek for thee? Look at verse 38. He said unto them, let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. He said, popularity, put that aside. Honor the honor of men. Put that aside. The praise of men. Put that aside. All men are looking for me. Put that aside. Here is the main focus of life. There are other cities. There are other countries. There are other places. Other people. Many corners of the world where they do not know Christ yet. They don't have the gospel yet. Let's go there. And he said, therefore am I come. And he preached in their synagogue throughout all, all Galilee and cast out devils. And let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 40. Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 verse 40. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. They were beaten. They were insulted. They were abused. They left that place rejoicing. That's the commitment we're talking about. That's the loyalty we're talking about. That's the passion we're talking about. That's the fervency we're talking about. That's the main focus of ministry we're talking about. It says they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. I pray that the same compassion and commitment will be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. The Lord has given us something to do. We're going to do it. I said, we're going to do it. You will preach the gospel. You'll pray for people. You'll counsel people. You'll lead people to the Lord. And many people, when you come to the Lord, you'll follow up after them too in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, I'm reading verse 13. Luke chapter 19, we're looking at verse 13. Luke chapter 19, verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. The Lord is calling you today. You have your secular employment yet. Paul, at the apostle too, had something he was doing. He was a tent maker. He did that too. But then, he didn't leave the work of God. The work of God did not suffer because of his tent making. Let not the work of God suffer. The district work. The zonal work. And the work in the house fellowship. And the women's work. And the youth work. And every other thing that the Lord has given us in the church, don't let that suffer. Let that be your main focus, your main priority. Don't let the tent making and in, and in salary, bread and butter, don't let that take the work of God away from your hand. Occupy until I come and be a true minister of Jesus Christ and continue to preach the gospel. Whether you're able to receive uh, any kind of praise or remuneration or not, or whether you have financial support or not, just preach. 
preach the gospel and do it in season and do it out of season and do it the way Paul the apostle did it night and day. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading there from verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Will you do it? I said, will you do it? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they, shall, when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own laws shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction. Some little difficulties will be there, challenges will be there, pressures will be there, persecutions might come, you will endure. Endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, of a soul winner, make full proof of your ministry. And if you do that, and you are going to do it, I said you are going to do it, the Lord will reward you abundantly in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. For what he has taught us today, he has revealed unto us in his word how Paul the apostle did it, how Timothy did it, how Silas did it, how those people did it. And now it's your turn, now it's my turn, that we will do it as well. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, you'll be focused, your priority will be there, you'll not backslide, and you'll not leave the work of the Lord. you give yourself, you commit your very life unto it. Open your mouth and pray and talk to the Lord. If you are not born again, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Re remember, repentance and remission of sin. Repentance and remission of sin. Repent of your sin. Give yourself to the Lord. And say, I forsake my darkness. I forsake my occultism. I forsake my iniquity. I forsake all my sins. I forsake all my transgressions. I forsake all my evil deeds. I come to the Lord. And the Bible says, Whosoever, whosoever, that's you, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. Repentance brings removal of sin. Forgiveness of sin. Remission of sin. Brings salvation. If you've been worshipping idols before, get rid of those idols. Throw them away. Throw them into the ocean. Or burn them with fire. Show your repentance. Show that you are really following after the Lord. Not a secret repentance. You forsake the old boyfriend, girlfriend, sin partner. You declare openly, publicly, I am now for the Lord. Then you follow the life of Christ, the life of the Christian. Be a new creature in Christ. And let your life show the shining light of the gospel. And remember character is a real thing. If you have lost your character, you have lost everything. Something lost his character, lost everything. Solomon lost his character, lost everything. Saul lost his character, lost everything. Keep the character, Christian character, Christian conduct. Christ's comportment. Keep it. Hold on to it. Character matters a lot. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new in your life, in your language, a new behavior, a new manner, a new motive, new method, new approach. If you are the hardened person before, now you are soft, now you are tender, now you are gentle. Let the gentleness of Christ be manifest in your life. The humility and the meekness of Christ. Let that be visible, demonstrative in your life. 
gentleness, meekness, humility, tenderness, softness, love, the affection of a mother. Pray that the Lord himself will walk out this glorious, gracious character in your life. Are you a preacher? Sir Paul the Apostle did it. The believers were precious to him. The converts were precious to him. The members of the church were precious to him, dear unto him. He wasn't knocking them, beating them, bro, beating them, overpowering them. Being cruel to them, being wicked to them, gentle, nice, compassionate, loving, affectionate, tender, loving. That's what the Lord wants. Are you gentle enough, loving enough, tender enough, caring enough? Compassionate enough. Be a leader that is known for your gentleness. A preacher that is known for your love. A pastor that is known for your tenderness. A worker that is known for your caring attitude. As a nursing mother, caring for her own children. You feed them tenderly. Counsel them faithfully. Direct them clearly, convincingly. Teach them how to walk by faith, not by sight. Remove stumbling stones and stumbling blocks away from them. If anyone has fallen... Show love, show concern, show compassion. Don't compromise, but show love. Don't encourage sin, but show love. Don't excuse their sin, but show love. Talk to them. Visit them. Pray with them. Show them the promises of God. Show them the way back to victory. As a mother cares, you care. As a mother nourishes, you nourish. As a mother feeds, you feed. Cherishes, you cherish. As a mother teaches, you teach. Disciple them. Grow them. Train them in the way of the Lord. Live a transparent life before them. Transcending love. Don't pick offenses. If they are immature, you show maturity. Be a mother. Be a father. Be a shepherd. Be a pastor. Be a leader. Be an example. And as you have received members of the church, give back to you, reciprocate. Love the pastor's back. Love the minister's back. Love the leader's back. Don't be so selfish that to receive, you are not giving. You receive love, you are not giving love back. Receive tenderness, gentleness. You're not giving tenderness and gentleness back. That will not be right. Show compassion too. Show tenderness too. Show gentleness too. Reciprocate. 
and receive the word of God. Ask the word of God. Don't just say that's coordinator talking. That's group coordinator talking. That's just the overseer. That's the way he talks. That's our pastor. That's the way he talks. Receive the word as the word of God. Paul the apostle told the Galatians, reminded them of the blessedness of the good old days. They were willing to pluck out their eyes to give to Paul the apostle. He said, maintain that attitude. And the Thessalonians too, deciding to see Paul, their pastor, their overseer, their apostle, their leader, their teacher, deciding greatly to see Paul as he was willing, deciding to see them. Two way traffic of love, of affection, of compassion, of faithfulness, of gentleness, of tenderness. Two way love comes to you, comes from you. So where affection comes to you, comes from you. So where faithfulness comes to you, comes from you. Give it back. Repay with love. Respond. With gentleness and tenderness. Give it back. Show your love to those who are ministering to you. Show the compassion. Show the passion. Show the affection. Show the loyalty. Show the faithfulness. Show the tenderness. Show the gentleness. And let's all win in. Be the center, the focus, the priority of your life. Soul winning. The passion, the focus of your very life. You see how Paul the Apostle labored night and day. How Nehemiah labored night and day. How the watchmen set over the people of God are to labor night and day. How the daughters of Zion are to call upon the Lord, letting the tears flow, pouring out their hearts before the Lord. For the people in the land, night and day. You see how those godly widows are to pray, to intercede, bringing restoration, redemption to Israel night and day. And those of us upon, who, upon whom the ends of the world are come. How are we to labor? How are we to pray? How are we to preach? How are we to sacrifice? Night and day calling upon the Lord that God will save souls that Christ will sanctify believers. Christ will purify his church, make his church holy. And the power of the Spirit of God will move freely, fully, completely in the church. Pray, preach, labor, travail, night and day. And if you do, and as you do, the Lord himself or reward your labor for souls being born again. And with those who are born again, being developed, discipled, matured, equipped, purified, sanctified, matured. And as more people are coming to maturity, the power of the Lord, the power of the Spirit, coming upon them and they serving the Lord without being tired or fainting. Let the story today be translated 
into your very life. Be it doers of the word, not hearers only.